Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar, brought to you by TechStrong and WhiteSource. My name is Cody J. Brown. I'm the host of TechStrong Learning. We have an exciting presentation ahead, but first, I have just a couple of housekeeping notes. First, today's session is being recorded. So if you miss any of our discussion or you'd like to rewatch, share with a friend, the on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude our live webinar today. If you have any questions, we want you to submit those using the Q&A tab on the right side of the screen. It's also where you're gonna find the chat tab where we want you to engage with us, engage with your fellow audience members, let us know your thoughts. And finally, before we close out, we will be giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards. So be sure to stick around till the very end. So our topic today is the complete guide to open source licenses 2022. And joining me is Sheree Ivtsen, Senior Director of Product Management at WhiteSource. Sheree, thank you so much for being here with me. I'm going to let you turn on your webcam and share your screen. Thanks for the intro, Cody. So it's really great to be here with all of you. Um, today we have a very interesting and also a special webinar because today we are going to look at the complete guide for open source licenses for 2022. Now, being in the open source community and being in white source, which is an open source management platform for the, around the last four years, um, we usually focus a lot on security, right? The security aspect of open source, the vulnerabilities aspect. And today we're looking at a completely different angle of open source, which is the licenses. And actually what makes an open source component open source is the license. Um, so it's a very interesting subject. Of course, that before we start, I have to say that I'm not a lawyer. Um, so all of the information that you'll see here is definitely written and approved by lawyers. Uh, but I'm going to uh, to try to make it maybe just a little more down to earth so you can understand. Um, as developers, as software people, usually when it comes to the legal aspect of open source, we're all like getting like blurry. Um, so it's really important for me uh, to try and, and explain it uh, a little better, I guess. So let's start. We know that around 60 to 80% of an average application uh, is comprised of open source. But not all open source components are equal, right? So what is different between one component and the other um, can be, of course, the language it, it's written in, it can be the number of vulnerabilities, it can be the quality of the code or uh, whether or not it's outdated. Um, but something that each and every software should have if it's out there in the internet um, is a license. So a license is basically a legal obligation to receive an approval from the author um, that actually has the copyrights on the software. So it's very interesting to think about it this way. But open source is very similar to any other creation, like a poem or even a movie, right? So um, it does have its own, like it's considered uh, a work in the eyes of the law. And, and what makes open source open source, as we already said, it's the license. And the license actually describes the terms and conditions on how we can use the software or how is, how is it allowed to actually use that software. And one interesting thing that I actually learned is that a lot of people think open source can be just used, modified, modified, and then combined into my software and then sold. 
uh, just because it's free and it's out there and we can see the source code doesn't necessarily mean that we can do anything we want with it. This is exactly why we need to be very conscious of what the license is. Now, if I'm thinking about the life of a developer or even a product person like me, there are two major events, I would say, when it's interesting for me to know something about open source licenses. So the first one is not that common, is what happens if uh, someone in my team or, or myself, I want to start a new open source project and I need to choose what license to put uh, on that open source project. And this has happened to me um, a few times in white source. And so, for example, um, a few months back uh, around the log for shell, the log for J events, uh, maybe some of you are familiar with this uh, zero day vulnerability. Uh, we try to release a tool that is open source. And one of the things that we had to attach to that open source code was the license. And this is where me as a product person, our legal team, or the developers would have to specify which license, which are what are the terms that people can use this open source under. Um, so this would be one event. The other event is a more day-to-day, uh, -day, I would say, um, is when I want to use another open source. Let's say I want to use Kubernetes or I want to use React or I want to use something like that. Uh, any open source project, basically. Uh, and I want to understand what's the license of that open source. But why would it matter, right? So this is where I think we need to further explain the idea of open source licenses and maybe also divide them into um, a few groups. So as we already said, the concept of a license is definitely like a legal agreement that's binding between the author of that open source. And of course, the author doesn't have to be one author that can be like hundreds of maintainers to that open source component and the user, the person who, you, who chooses to use that open source. And so this is what actually allows us as developers, as product people, as software person um, to use that software, right? To combine it into our code. But this is not always true. So in some cases, even though the code is out there and we can see it, we cannot really use it based on its terms. So it's really important to uh, understand the idea of software licenses. Now, we usually divide the open source components or the open source licenses, I would say, into two main uh, categories. So first of all, we have the concept of copyright in general. And copyright is a simple law that restricts the right to use, modify, and share any creative work without the permission of the copyright holder. Um, when we're speaking about code, the copyright holder will be the person who actually wrote the code. And now we have the concept of copyleft. Copyleft basically, and again, not to go too much into legal terms, I'll try to make it very simple. Um, Copyleft license means that you can use the open source component if you release your code as open source, right? So again, if I'm part of the open source community, I want to release something as open source, I can use any copyleft license, basically. This is the first category. It has been very popular when open source just started. The idea was that the people who started the open source community wanted everything to be open source, right? They wanted everything to be free. 
So they started just putting all of their work under the copyleft license to make sure that anyone that uses that will also release their product or their code is open source, like sort of this community idea. This is the first category. Um, as I said, it was very popular in the beginning of open source, and we will soon see some statistics on how it's becoming a little less popular right now. The second category is the permissive open source license. And permissive open source license is a non-copyleft uh, open source license that basically guarantees the freedom to use, to modify, to redistribute, um, and also permitting like proprietary works. So permitting open source license, basically like anything goes, um, has very minimal restrictions on how others uh, can use open source components. So that means basically that this type of license, uh, as you can see, it's the bottom one. So like, you know, um, Apache is the most popular one. Um, BSD is also very, uh, very popular in MIT, of course. This means that if you use this type of license, it's give you, it gives you a lot of freedom to use, to modify, um, to distribute it to use it in your software and then maybe sell your software. So there are a lot less obligations um, in terms of that open source component. So basically you need nothing and you don't really need anything in order to move forward. So these are the two main categories. What I would like to say is that, again, trying to put it in very simple words, but eventually um, the open source licensing is a legal world, right? It's a world of uh, lawyers uh, who have a lot of expertise in it. Um, anyone can start a new license, okay? So for example, I can, I don't have to you if I start my open source project today, I write the code. I don't have to use any of the known licenses. By the way, I'm not sure we mentioned it, but there are over 200 open source licenses. Um, so I can just start my own license. I can write a new license. Uh, there is a buy me a beer license. Um, there are all kinds of licenses out there. Um, and I can just start and write my own rules on how to use that open source. What the Open Source Foundation, the OSI, actually did is it tried to sort of map um, the top 80 approved open source licenses. So this is also something that you can find um, in the report that uh, is available or in the cheat sheet or probably in many places online, uh, you can find that list of 80 open source um, licenses that are sort of approved. Because uh, that means that someone read them and approved them, and you can definitely use one of those. So we sort of understood why it's important to uh, be familiar with open source licenses. We understood the concept of licensing in software. Um, and we also went through the two main categories that are copyleft. Again, if I uh, use this uh, a component, I have to release my code as open source or the permissive license, which basically doesn't uh, have any restrictions and I can uh, do whatever I want with that code. So once it's pretty clear that once I choose a new component to use, um, if I'm a commercial uh, software, uh, for example, uh, here at White Source, uh, we would try to avoid copy left licenses, right? Because we don't want to release all of our code as open source. 
and we would try to choose components that note is that there are no like good or bad licenses, right? It's all about what you are trying to do. Um, so it can be that like a copyleft license is perfect for you because you distribute your software as open source. That means that you can basically use any copyleft license, um, of course, with the specific restrictions. Um, and on the other hand, maybe there is another uh, license that should work for you just fine. So it's all about how you are going to release your software, how you are going to sell it. Um, it's really important that there is, it's not like, you know, when you have a vulnerability in your code, it's bad. It's something that's not good, it puts risk. Uh, but it's not the same with software licensing. So there is no like one definite good or bad license. Um, so what we basically did is we tried to map out the top open source licenses in 2021 and tried to see some of the trends over the years. So this is why I said like, yeah, copyleft license was very popular in the beginning of the years, but now it's less popular. Um, so we will try to first look at the data, see how it makes sense, but then also get all kinds of insights from that data as well. So what we basically see is that it's not really a surprise that permissive open source licenses continue to dominate, right? So the Apache 2.0 license, which we already discussed as a permissive license, and the MIT license are far more popular than the GPL family, right? Together, they compromise over 50% of all the open source licenses currently in use. We can see that, again, we discussed it, right? Permissive licenses, they place very minimal restrictions on how others can use open source components. So, each one of those licenses, like let's say Apache versus MIT, permits varying degrees of freedom to use, to modify, um, and even to re redistribute open source code and allows the use of permissive license open source component uh, in any work. And it requires nearly nothing in return. This is why this license is actually becoming so popular um, around open source users. So another thing that we can see is that if we're looking back at like 2012, right? Almost uh, 10 years ago, we can see the permissive versus the uh, copyleft licenses over time. And we can see that before that, right? The, copyleft licenses definitely ruled the world of open source. Uh, I think, again, this was part of uh, the, the want to have like a community um, that everything will be open source. And as the years went along, uh, and we will discuss it also later um, in the webinar, more and more uh, giant players like Microsoft and others uh, entered into the game of open source and they no longer needed this copyleft license and a lot of the a lot of their work is under MIT sorry is under permissive licenses. Uh, so for example, things like Kubernetes uh, is under a permissive license. So moving on, and as we said, right, Apache 2 definitely takes the lead. And this is not a surprise for us, but we can see that it definitely takes the, the first place. Uh, by the way, the first place back in 2020 was MIT, uh, and now it's becoming the second place. And as I said, Apache 2.0 um, is the license for quite a few open source projects. So Kubernetes is one of them. This, by the way, may be the reason why more and more 
open source projects actually adopt this license. And its popularity is definitely uh, keeps rising. Now, when we look at Apache 2.0, the great thing about it, of course, other than being permissive, is that it's pretty straight, straightforward. Um, the other very straightforward license is MIT. And one of the things that developers really like about MIT is that it's really short, right? The license description is very short. You don't have to be a lawyer to understand all the different bits and bytes of the license. And again, this can come to a very like legal language sometimes uh, that's hard to understand for, you know, the, a, a developer or even just a person uh, who is not uh, a lawyer. So this is sort of the trend that we can see with Apache 2.0. Um, it has been very popular over the years, but it's definitely gaining more and more popularity as we go. So the other thing that we wanted to uh, focus on is sort of the uh, a very interesting license, which is again, the MIT. Um, we discussed it uh, this year, it definitely took the second place with 26% of open source licenses. Um, so when, uh, and something that we didn't mention is that GitHub has a website, choosealicense.com. And this sort of gives you very um, handy information about different open source licenses. And what it says about MIT is that first of all, it's a permissive license. Um, but second, that it's very easy to understand and read. So this is why developers like it so much. The second thing that we can definitely see is that the GPL v3 and GNU GPL family in general um, is starting to or continues to decrease in the popularity. So it's very, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? Apache and the other permissive licenses go up um, and the GPL license goes down over the years. And so, you know, with the revolution of open source and we see less of the copyleft or the viral license. So, it's important to understand that when users incorporate a component license under one of the GPL licenses, they must release their source code, <coughs> excuse me, and the right to modify and distribute the entire code. So basically they need to both like have the source code in, an, in a, a visible place like GitHub, for example, but also they need to release it as open source, meaning that other people can also like modify and distribute the code. Another important note is that they are required to release their source code under the same GPL license, right? So GPL v3, GPL v2, there are different kinds of GPL and we won't get too much into the details of what each specific GPL license means, because again, that's too complicated for a short webinar like ours. And there will always be GPL users, like for example, the Linux kernel license created by a huge open source community is licensed under GPL. However, it's pretty clear that at this point, um, Business-wise, the preference is for a license with fewer restrictions, fewer limitations. So once I choose which open source component to use, I will definitely not go for something that's so restrictive. So this is a short summary of how we see the trends in terms of the years.
um, in some of the insights that we saw. Now, I do want to touch upon like what's next for open source licensing. And some people think that, yeah, open source licensing is, <coughs> it's there. But it's a world that's already sort of uh, stagnant, doesn't change that much. Um, I think completely the opposite. Because I think as open source evolves, there are more and more open source projects. There is a need to develop more and more licensing mechanisms and business ideas on how to actually license the software. Um, so these are some of the takeaways that uh, that I had. So first of all, the tension between creating a viable business model and maintaining a robust and successful open source project definitely continues to grow. I think that a lot of us ha have questioned like, okay, have this new project. Should I make it a commercial project? Should I make it an open source project? What are the pros and cons of each decision that I will make? So I think we will continue to see open source projects that are sort of struggling to find the balance between making a profit. Uh, so like having a, a, even a, a license that uh, you need to pay in order to use that open source um, and between being supportive members of open source community. So as much as support for open source community continues to grow, we will most probably see more hardworking, unpaid creators and maintainers um, of small but very critical projects that are sort of updating license for better business model or maybe even um, stopping to contribute to open source just because of burnout. And this is a real problem of the open source community, right? The funding of open source projects, <clears throat> some of them even very critical ones um, are not getting enough funds and the maintainers or the contributor just stop doing that because they can't. And so, this is a very important note. And as the open source community continues um, to expand and to evolve, there will be new business models that will rise and fail. Um, there is a decentralized nature of open source components, right? This is the entire concept. It's open source. It's out there. Anyone can write it. Anyone can use it. Um, so there will always be a pretty wide spectrum of diverse opinions and new ideas. And therefore, I think also new license or new solutions to the license mechanisms of open source. So one thing that sort of remains certain, at least for me, is that open source is here to stay. And as it appears currently, when it comes to licenses, the more freedom we have, this is better. So the community prefers like freedom, very permissive licenses. I want to be able to do whatever I want with that open source, other than the initial approach of the open source community, which that was like very restrictive and everything is either viral or copy left licenses. And so we are towards the end, but I did want to give you some sort of a, a cheat sheet um, of some very popular licenses, right? So the GNU uh, GPL, this is the general public license. Um, and these components, of course, we already mentioned it. If you're using a GPL license, you need to release all your um, code is open source. <clears throat> and there are some other terms that are maybe not uh, the first thing you see. And this is why we try to summarize them for you. So uh, definitely you're not al allowed to claim any patents or copyrights on the software. You need to display a copyright notice. Um, you're not allowed to change the license. And of course, 
if you release the code, um, you give the right to release your code and the right to modify and distribute your entire code base. Um, there is a class path exception. So if this is interesting for you, this is also part of the cheat sheet that you can uh, that you can go ahead and read. The other family or like category of open source licenses are the permissive licenses. So like, uh, yeah, MSPL, uh, Apache, which was discussed here pretty much uh, all the time and the BSD license. Um, each one of them has some tweaks and some specific terms, but in general, those are all part of the permissive license family. And so if you want less restrictions on the open source that you're using, you should probably use this one. Unless, of course, you're writing an open source project and, and you don't really care about uh, having like a copyleft GPL license. So I guess this is more or less it for today. Uh, two important notes. First of all, being aware of what license you're using or choosing or um, even when selecting a new component or when doing a sort of a due diligence to another um, software vendor, it's really important to be aware that there are all kinds of licenses and not all open source projects were born the same and not all of them are equal. Uh, so be aware and, and choose the right license. And the other thing is that we have a very uh, handy cheat sheet that you can read um, in order to understand. So once you have like a license that I didn't discuss in this webinar, um, you're not familiar with it. So it, so it may uh, appear there. It may appear on the 80 uh, approved licenses or it can be a license that you can just go ahead and read the terms and if needed, uh, consult a lawyer um, just to make sure that you're doing the right thing. Um, so this was it for today. I really want to thank you everyone for um, being here, for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to ping me uh, by LinkedIn or later. Uh, and I'll return it back to Cody to give you some gift cards. Thank you, Cody. And Shuri, thank you for being here with us today. Um, first, I'd like to remind our audience that today's session was recorded. So following this webinar, you'll receive an email with a link to access the recording on demand. You can also find this webinar living on the DevOps website at devops.com slash webinars, and be sure to look in the on-demand section. So to those four winners that Sheree mentioned, um, our first winner is Paris A. Our second winner is Amy F. Our third winner is Wilson M. And our fourth and final winner is Kamina A. So to the four of you, congratulations. Keep an eye on your inbox to claim that to claim that gift card. And if you don't receive an email, just check your spam folder. I would like to thank White Source for sponsoring today's webinar. And I would like to also thank you, our audience. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you spending your time with us. Please just take one extra moment to fill out a brief post-webinar survey that should pop up on your screen here in just a moment. But otherwise, we hope to see you at a future upcoming TechStrong Learning webinar. Everyone have a great rest of your day.